Welcome to today's news briefing, co-hosted by Ethnic Media Services and Vaccinate All 58 with the California Department of Public Health. I'm Sandy Close, EMS Director and today's moderator. Today, our news briefing explores what parents and caregivers need to know about vaccinating California's youngest kids, especially those age six months to four years against COVID-19. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration authorized emergency use of two COVID-19 vaccines made by Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech for children six months to four years old. Vaccination is an important tool to protect their long-term health against COVID-19 and helps achieve full family protection against this deadly virus. The approval comes on the heels of news that COVID-19 is now the fifth leading cause of death in children one to four years old and the fourth leading cause of death in children younger than one. Sobering statistics for all of us. Our speakers include Dr. Lucia Abascal with the California Department of Public Health. So we begin. Welcome, Dr. Lucia Abascal. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Sandy, for that introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be with all of you. As Sandy mentioned, I am with uh, the California Department of Public Health. I also work at UCSF as a global health researcher focusing on vaccine uptake. Um, and my eight, 19 month old daughter uh, just go, got COVID two weeks ago. <laughs> I've been waiting for two, I mean, I was pregnant when the pandemic started. I've been waiting for that vaccine all this time and she tested positive, but I guess that's how these things are. And in our case, she did transmit the virus both to my husband and I, and I am uh, 32 weeks pregnant. <laughs> so that was, I mean, I was being extra careful myself, but well, uh, just like a heads up of the situation we're, looking, we're living right now, we've seen an increase in cases in California. I mean, globally, but in California, it seems to be get flattening out, but we're still seeing uh, in some uh, spaces a lot of cases. This is due to the highly contagious Omicron sub subvariants that have been circulating. So there is definitely still a need for vaccinations for the whole population, but now we have a new population that has the vaccine available for them. This is very important. There's this idea uh, that Omicron is milder. But if we look at children's at children data in this age group, we can actually see that hospitalizations picked the record uh, in January, February, when the Omicron surge started for this uh, group, as well as deaths. So definitely there is a need to vaccinate young kids. The misconception that kids are safe that nothing happens to kids is wrong. We have more and more evidence that kids are at an acute risk of being hospitalized for COVID. We've definitely seen some deaths. Kids can also suffer from like midterm consequences such as multi-inflammatory uh, um, syndrome in, in children and long COVID has also been reported in kids. So there's definitely a need to protect these young kids. We also know that even though uh, people can get COVID vaccinated, as we've seen in adults, but you can also get that in children, but protection for severe disease is there. And that's what we saw uh, with the FDA's authorization. So uh, just going over a little bit of, uh, of what the, the steps for the approval were, um, we had an, an independent expert panel 
that went over the data that both Moderna and Pfizer submitted. They are expert in these uh, topics. They're, they don't, they're not government workers, so that's why it's called an independent panel. They went over the data and they all voted unanimously. They all voted uh, to recommend that the FDA approved uh, the vaccine. After that, we had a big FDA meeting where they went over everything. That is public data. You can go over the slides that were presented. You can go over the data. This is uh, to create trust, to create transparency. Uh, similarly to the independent panel, they all approved the vaccine. Why? Because the vaccine uh, was shown to be effective. The number, the efficacy numbers we were shown in that meeting, uh, even though weren't as high as what we saw when the adult vaccine was approved uh, two years ago. Well, no, sorry, like one year ago for the adults vaccine. We, we did see efficacy that was expected with the subvariants that are circulating now, right? So we know that the vaccine works. And another thing that was presented was the safety profile of both vaccines. And we were shown that both vaccines were safe. Okay, so after the FDA approved this, then the decision jumps to the CDC, right? So the CDC then makes a public health recommendation from the federal level to states to, uh, and they approved it as well. Now, going down to California. So I just wanted to show you all the steps that go into the approval of the vaccines. So then the, when the CDC makes the recommendation, approves the vaccine, uh, California goes over the data and, as w and with the neighboring states, they decided that it was the best for children in California to get the vaccine. So what is going to happen uh, with the deployment of the vaccines in the states? We knew this, this was happening. We weren't sure when, but California knew this was happening. So a while back, the state started working directly with pediatricians for them to get enrolled in a program to receive the doses they might need. So with this program, the state enrolled um, a lot of pediatricians that actually cover around 85% of the state's children. It gets a little bit tricky with younger children. Why? because adults can get a COVID vaccine at the pharmacy, right? But federal regulations don't allow pharmacies to vaccinate children under three. So we have in this population, a small group that will be able to be vaccinated at the pharmacy, but we have the bigger group between six months and three years that will need to go either directly to their pediatrician or a small community clinics that will be set up depending on the county, uh, where, where, where children uh, live. So it will be very important that parents reach out to their care providers uh, for this, because we don't have either the mass vaccination sites, and we don't have uh, this big access with pharmacies. The state has purchased enough vaccines for every child in California, and they will start coming in batches. So by this week, we're expected to receive around half a million uh, vaccines. Um, which will start um, vaccinated, vaccinating children. So we are um, expectant. We haven't seen the uptake in older kids that we would want to see. Uh, we, there's a lot of work to do informing parents, really getting them to understand the need that exists for this vaccine. So that's very important. Um, in terms of what vaccines will be offered, this will also be different to what we've seen with other your older groups of children. Why? Because both Moderna and Pfizer will be available for, for children since the beginning. What will be different? So this can also be tricky and confusing to parents, but we have two vaccines, both Moderna and Pfizer. The Moderna is a two dose, just like adults. The first vaccination, um, Schedule is two doses with a month in the middle. Then we have the Pfizer. So Pfizer is actually three smaller doses. And that's why it's the Pfizer data took a little bit longer to come in. So what is the timing for those vaccines? So for, for Moderna, we have the first dose, dose, then a month, and then the second dose. 
So we would expect children to be fully vaccinated two weeks after their second dose. That is uh, compared to Pfizer, which will take a little bit longer. We'll have the first dose, then 21 days later, children can get their second dose. And then 60 days later, children can get their third dose. So this um, schedule of vaccination might take, might take, not might, but takes longer than the Moderna. So some parents might prefer to go with a faster uh, effectiveness compared to the slower one. But uh, why is this? Moderna uses a bit of a stronger dose. So the Moderna the vaccines are one fourth of the adult dose. The Pfizer vaccines are one tenth. So you, you can see how Moderna is a, a, higher, a higher dose than the, the Pfizer one. Both are very safe, but uh, a little bit of like stronger side, immediate side effects were seen with the Moderna. What do I mean with that? Children presented a little bit more fever and a little bit more um, irritability after the Moderna vaccines than the Pfizer. Just want to make clear that these were minor, uh, treated at home and disappeared um, after two days. So both safety profiles are, are very good, very positive. We did not see any, um, any like severe effects in the children. But we have to remember that most of the rare side effects we see once we've vaccinated millions of children. So we still have to wait and see, and we're definitely going to follow up on side effects that children can develop. So those are the two vaccines that have been approved for this uh, age group in could California. I, could yeah. I interrupt you just quickly? A question in the chat. You said 16 or 60 days. 60. That's two months. Wanna just want to emphasize that for interpreters. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Um, so just in terms of California, we're looking at 2.2 million children that will be eligible to uh, receive this vaccine. So definitely a very, very big state with a very big uh, group of eligible children. Now, go ahead, uh, please. No, no, we can we can go with questions, and that way I can just answer them. Well, a couple of questions before we go to the chat. How did your child do with COVID? How serious a case was it? And would you? There is a question of if your child does have COVID, how long do you need to wait before you get vaccinated? the vaccination for the child? Yes, so so my daughter actually uh, was fine. I mean, she did have a fever for three days. She's a very healthy child, so that was surprising. She was tired. I think the hardest part was staying inside with her. We, were, we continued to test positive up to like 10 days. So definitely being inside, both of us, uh, both parents were sick. Uh, we were fine also, but just like you, all you want to do is uh, watch TV and rest, but you have a one and a half year old that just wants to do the opposite. So uh, that for us was the toughest. I mean, also for me as a, a, I was in my, I am in my third trimester of my pregnancy. So also managing that closely with my doctors um, to see if I if I should take medication or not, but thankfully I was also fine, and my my the son I'm expecting is also fine. So we're all doing great. But uh, my I think actually my daughter was the one that had it the toughest. Uh, my husband and I did never get a fever because we're we're both vaccinated and boosted. So definitely a need there. Uh, in terms of waiting for the vaccine. Mm, there is no, so, so at the beginning of the vaccine rollout, everybody said, if you just got COVID, wait. This was more of a supply issue, right? So um, we know that uh, even though natural immunity is not as good as the vaccine immunity, it exists, right? So we, at the beginning of the vaccine rollout a while back, we did not have enough vaccines to serve everybody we wanted to vaccinate. So there was this idea that, people that had just recently gotten COVID could wait a little bit uh, to get their vaccine. 
Now we have enough supply for everybody. So people can get vaccinated immediately after having COVID once they end their isolation period. There's no um, side effects. There's no issue with doing that. I'm getting my daughter uh, vaccinated as soon as possible. And I'm not waiting. You mentioned that the vaccines are now available. Could you tell us if it is your recommendation that if people don't have a medical provider to go to, that they could visit myturn.ca.gov? Could you give us a little information about that? Yes. So uh, our first, our first recommendation for parents that have access to a pediatrician or have uh, worked with pediatricians before is to 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 go that go that route. But definitely using my term, my term, uh, .ca .gov also works for parents, and they can also find their uh, kids' vaccines that way. And another question that has been texted to me is if the symptoms are mild in young kids and uh, what is the point of vaccinating them? Why expose them to possible side effects? What is your best argument on that, Dr. Abascal? Well, first I would ask them to define mild, right? I mean, I definitely say that my child got a mild infection. She was still in bed three days with a fever which is, I think, more than I would expect after the vaccine. Uh, she also transmitted the disease to me and to my husband, right? So, I mean, that's a risk I did not want to take. A lot of, we have a lot of families. I am, I am Mexican and uh, in our community, we have a lot of multi-generational families. So this time my daughter infected both healthy adults, but there's a lot of grandparents that also live with children, right? And that's that's another risk we have to consider because vaccines, vaccines serve different functions. The first one is to protect oneself, right? So uh, even if it's not a perfect protection, there's, there's protection against getting infected. So you do slash that out. We actually saw that with Moderna, uh, with the vaccine in these kids, that's around 30 to 50% reduced infection. Uh, with Pfizer, their reported, their reported data is up to 80% after the third dose. So there's definitely a, a smaller probability of getting infected, right? So that's the first step. Then if we do get infected, which could definitely happen, we have a way, way lower probability of ending in the hospital. If we end up in the hospital, a lower probability of ending at the, in the ICU. We end up in the ICU, a lower probability of, of death. So we, we see benefits in all of the steps um, uh, of the disease, right? Then, so it protects oneself, it protects others in our household, it protects others in our community, right? My, my daughter got infected at daycare, right? So we have there a cluster of children and this is happening in their households as well. I know that other parents, in my uh, daughter's classroom also got infected, right? So if we slash the probability of children getting sick, we slash the probability of these clusters happen. And then lastly, we have the global idea, right? So if more people have immunity because of vaccines, we, um, we make uh, COVID cases less explosive. We um, also, so variants, we also fight against the emergence of new variants that happen because the virus is not uh, pressured by the immune system. So we, we do see a lot of benefits of infecting, of vaccinating, sorry, uh, children, but everybody as well. Also, we know that even children with mild infections, even children with asymptomatic infections are at risk of developing a multi-inflammatory um, syndrome in children. That's a, a disease that can make them go to the hospital. All of their body, all of their organs get uh, inflamed because of an exaggerating immune response. And similarly, uh, children with mild infections can also have long COVID. We have, even if it's not great data, and we have, a, we have seen a little, uh, very different numbers, we have seen evidence that vaccines do reduce the risk of long COVID. So definitely, even if it's a mild case, we should, um, we should vaccinate. And then in terms of reinfection, 
We've seen that vaccines hold up way better against new variants and subvariants than natural immunity. Even though the body does create immunity after being exposed to COVID, this is very dependent on the person's immune system. But vaccines create a stronger and better immune response that can protect against different variants. And this is something we don't see as strong as with uh, natural immunity. And a mild case can have a mild immune response. So even if your child uh, has a mild case, vaccines will build up the better response. Actually, and Moderna did show that data comparing natural immunity and, and vaccination. We saw that vaccination did create a bigger immune response. And then they compared that to children that had been previously infected and gotten a vaccine. And children that had been previously infected and got, it the, and got the vaccine were actually the most protected group. This is not surprising. This has been reported as hybrid immunity and has been widely reported. And it's a very like big case for vaccinated children that have had COVID before. And I think I'm even excited that my daughter will now get the vaccine because she'll have these like super strong antibodies. Right. Two questions quickly from the chat. Myocarditis. You referenced myocarditis. Could you just... Uh, say one or two sentences about the very low risk of myocarditis, which yes. I believe, uh, and, and what the trials with the vaccines demonstrated for the youngest kids. Yes, what was seen on the trials, uh, there were no cases of myocarditis reported. This is good, but it's expected given the, that myocarditis shows up when we uh, vaccinate a lot of children. Uh, what we've seen, what has emerged in population-based studies, not only in the US, but worldwide, is that myocarditis affects younger, uh, older children, right? So up, uh, from 16 and up, and it seems to be a mixture of hormones and the vaccine. So it's really not a risk expected in this population, but we have to wait and see what the follow-up as we uh, ramp up vaccination is. Thank you. And then can my child receive the COVID-19 vaccine and other vaccines on the same day? <laughs> yes, uh, they can get vaccinated. There's no interference. Uh, Aaliyah Lee asks, and this again goes to the choice between Moderna and uh, Pfizer, my child is 18 months old. Is it? Is there a preference, depending on age, for uh, three doses versus two doses, or does it come down to whatever is available? Uh, Dr. Abascal. I think what is available will be the best. Uh, just to add something uh, on the Moderna vaccine, we, we also expect that to have a booster uh, just as we, we've had with other vaccines. So eventually that will also be three doses, uh, even if it takes a little bit longer. That's what it looks like. Um, so, so I think it, it really depends on what's available and what kind of like do you want, if you have both options, like do you prefer to wait, but get maybe lower uh, immediate side effects, even though we don't expect anything severe from any, or just uh, get get Moderna? I, I think I have Moderna available at my pediatrician's uh, office as well, and I think I'm going to, to do that with my daughter just to get her vaccinated. But I mean, both vaccines, and we have data on other age groups for the Pfizer vaccines, and and we know that it works and that it's safe. So I think uh, we have enough data to like confidently say it's okay. Like you, you can't go wrong. And I think that's the message we also say to adults, right? Like both Moderna and Pfizer are, are equal. So you, you can't go wrong. And the, all of us are storytellers. Most of us serve communities that disproportionately were impacted by the pandemic. Gradually, the vaccination rates for Black, Latino, and Asian and Native peoples, peoples of color, 
have risen at a par, and even in some areas, more higher rates of vaccination uh, than their white Caucasian counterparts. But will this be true for children? And I guess, what is your message for communities of color, parents of color, and their children? Yes, I, I think this is a message I usually give to my Spanish speaking uh, public I speak with, uh, but I think it, it applies to uh, all like racial and ethnic minorities, is that we know COVID has disproportionately affected these groups. We know that. But we now have a chance to turn the table and really have a tool that can help us reverse that. So it's on us, uh, as, as I mean, as CDPH, as, as a public health agency, but also as parents to take that decision. We always want to make the right decision for our children. As a mother, as a doctor, as a researcher, I know that. I know how hard it is, but we also have the tools to inform ourselves with our doctors, uh, looking at uh, information, asking questions. And if you want to make a decision, just make sure it's the right decision because we have vaccines that work. And I mean, that's, that's what I usually tell them. Like, we have the tools to not be as affected as we've been. On behalf of all of our media on today's call, my heartfelt thanks for your time and my thanks to the California Department of Public Health Vaccinate All 58 for supporting us in today's briefing. Thank you all. This conference is now adjourned. Thank you.